M. Hi. You're going to hear John Cruz talking about implementing an adaptive user interface. Um, and here he is. Uh, keep the questions till the end. Thank you. <laughs> so, let's see. Okay, welcome. That's not really working for you guys, is it? Let's try. Let's see if we can adjust just things a little here. Oh, look at that! How boring. There we go. So, welcome. Uh, my name is John Cruz. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I work primarily on the Inkscape project, which is a vector graphic drawing application. I've also been participating in several other related projects as we've moved forward, some involving color, resource, graphics, printing, professional work there. And this time, I'd like to give you an overview of something we call adaptive user interface. That, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but is something that has come up in recent years. So during this talk, what should you expect? Probably by the end, have some idea of what it is, some idea why you probably do care about it, and then eventually what steps you might be able to take to get started on either requesting or implementing the adaptive interfaces yourself. So I'm going to first posit that there are several implementations that first started for years and years. Many things have been tried to make user interfaces work. Some of them have been more successful for, than others, and some in different ways. So we have VI as one of the first, which often people think of as the epitome of the modal interface. And if you talk to user interface designers, they often will tell you modal is bad. You talk to VI users, they'll tell you modal is great. There's really usually not much of a middle ground on this point, and it just is an example of switching in and out of things, but for some people it may work, but for others it might be getting in the way. Next up as a quick overview. Who, who here has ever heard of Microsoft Bob? <laughs> has anyone here run it, used it, liked it? <laughs> so what, what can we really say about Bob? Well, Microsoft Bob gave us such wonderful things as the slow me down search dog, Comic Sans MS font, and Clippy, the office assistant. Yay! Um, I think that's pretty much says it's all, all right there. Moving on, the, Microsoft also has another interesting attempt at dynamic interface with their min dynamic menus. If something's tricky, they hit it from you, but if you really want to, you can turn it back on. And then that has moved into their ribbon interface, you know, those efforts, but they really Slight, are just slightly interesting, but just aren't, don't seem that useful. And then Eclipse. Has anyone here used the Eclipse IDE? Oh, quarter. Not, not too bad. They have something called perspectives, where they'll switch from your Java perspective to your debugging perspective to whatever else third-party things you add on. They're very interesting, very capable, but something is just off. They seem fairly jarring and it's not cohesive. And as a user who's used all sorts of programs, I mean, VI, Emacs, everything else, I love that. This aspect of Eclipse, I hate because it's just not quite there. It's a good, good idea, but it, this is a case where the implementation doesn't quite match. And that's what, perhaps that's what you get putting engineers in charge of user interface. As we know, we never do that. So, now on to what is adaptive technology or adaptive user interface. Some people consider that similar offhand to assistive technology that they might have heard of. It's different. What, what we have, well, with assistive technology, that's more the kind of things where you have screen readers, magnifiers, keyboard um, accessibility things, things to help people with different abilities use a computer 
as per anyone else who doesn't have the special requirements. That can be helped by adaptive user interfaces, but it's not the same thing. What an adaptive user interface does is takes the viewpoint of how to design the interface away from user-centric through role-centric and ends up at a task-centric approach. So what is the user-oriented in interface? That's where they say, you, your sysadmin. You know what to do. You know, you know this, we'll give you VI, you'll be happy. There, now you're done. We don't have to do anything else for you. You, your graphic artist, we'll give you a Mac. There, we're done. <laughs> but no, well, a Mac now is a Unix box out when you pick it up in the store. Maybe an admin might want to have an actually commercial vendor-supported Unix box in his hands. That's a little different. So, and maybe a sysadmin might have to draw some diagrams, network diagrams, blocking. So the individual, either in general or specific, is user-centric. Role-oriented then goes on to be that task where, oh, I'm an admin, I'm ad admin in a box, I'm going to use SSH, I got, you know, all this stuff. That's the role I'm playing right there. This afternoon, I have to do the network diagram so I can show my boss. In that case, he's playing the role of the technical illustrator. Same individual, different roles. Task-oriented is a bit of what's new with adaptive interface, at least in the focus, whereas roles are very concrete, you know, a, an individual might play different roles at different times, at least people have come to know that, but you have the sysadmin, graphic designer, technical illustrator, all these roles that are segmented, and so you need the tool for that use. But when you're doing some of these things, you have, like the technical illustrator and the graphic designer, when they're trying to get some diagramming correct, they might need very precise snapping controls. That's the task. What do they have to do at the middle? And task cuts across multiple roles. So you have little, much finer grain functionality there to run through those grids. So to sum up, an adaptive user interface adapts. That's what makes it different. Well, gee, that doesn't help so much. So what actually is adaptive? The u user interface changes to adapt to the specific user. Me, I have smaller hands. If I have to stretch halfway across the keyboard to do some combination, I can't do that. <laughs> um, someone else sitting there with larger hands have, finds no problems with that. Other things, my vision, 2040, 2020, somewhere in that range, not too bad. So I have no problem with small text. Other people do. You have to accommodate that. Also adapts to the hardware being used. Um, laptop all sorts of other things, other situations. Input hardware could be different. Some might have other needs when I'm doing something that art, graphics, anything else with a graphics tablet, especially technical diagram, UML sketching, I don't want to have to keep going back to the keyboard. I want to just hold this in my hand. I've got all these fancy buttons. They can light up and tell me different things, but if your software doesn't use it, I can't use it. A little bit more on that. And then the environment in which things are being used. That is a bit fuzzier, but it helps enclose or, or cover all the other items that might come in to be a factor that you forget about. And knowing that that is there as an item to keep in mind lets you start thinking out of the box. Oh, this is a phone app. They might be outside. Maybe we should make it a little more visible in the sunlight. You know, little things like that. And it accommodates, more importantly, the specific task at hand. At this moment, this user needs to get this next step done. So an adaptive user interface should change to match the situation of the moment. From moment to moment, things are different. Once you start to get all this in mind when you're designing things, whether if you're the UI designer, if you're the user, if you're the internal implementer of an API that's going to be consumed, if you're in a network situation or a web app, Maybe the back end has to provide a little more context and information so the middle layer and the GUI layer and the Ajax layer can do the helpful thing. So what you want to be able to do is perform the needed task in the current environment uh, on the platform being used. That's kind of like your um, business mission statement. You know, 
all really nice, easy to say, but a yeah, little fuzzy. It helps you remember what to focus on, though. So, given that, what hardware do we have to adapt to? Probably some people in this room have a little bit better idea. Handhelds, Android, iPhone, Palm, WebOS, all those. How many here in this room have one of these devices or a similar one? Blackberry, I didn't put on there because they're business enough. Okay. You know, a quarter of the people just in this room. So that's not an insignificant market, and it's only growing by leaps and bounds. What other hardware might you want to keep in mind? Web-based hardware. A laptop running a web interface is different than a laptop running an application directly. Kiosk might be web-based, all sorts of other things. And that is a different situation where technically you're running on several different pieces of hardware. You've got the server running there, you've got the middle tier here, the database server over there, the end user, couple of components, multi-head proxy for the handheld device he's using, and then the device itself. That's a lot of hardware. Then another big one now is set-top. People have a cable boxes, DVRs, Myth TV, many things like that. Or game systems. Some of the better media management and playback libraries came written first for proprietary game boxes. And probably the biggest one here, netbooks. How many, how many here have a netbook in this room right at this moment? About a third. How many people know someone personally who has a netbook? There you go, most of the people here. And those are very interesting because they have the unique characteristics of being much more underpowered. So Moore's Law has been increasing your power, then suddenly everybody took it away from you. Why? Because it's convenient. It helps for certain things. Also, the screens have been getting bigger. Suddenly the netbooks say, no, you don't have a screen. In fact, no, we'll give you a little bit, but we'll stretch it really skinny. Just, just to mess with you, just, just so you can't use it as easily. So... Given some of the overall abstract ideas and presentation and what an adaptive user interface might be and might entail, it's a little hard to say, well, what does that really mean? You know, some of these things I've been tossing out are a little fuzzy and a little, oh, yeah, whatever, yeah, sounds good. Can you actually show me something? So that's why we have a little bit where we're trying to show some of these principles being integrated now into Inkscape. Well, or, as I like to say, I, for one, welcome our new cybernetic overlord. Oh, wait, did I say overlord? I meant protector. Now, <laughs> this actually hits on one little point to be covered later, so just keep it in mind, this attitude and approach, because there's, there's something hiding in here that's going to be helpful. But what do we have here? As far as uh, problems, well, maybe you, you, you're engineers, you're open source people, you, you shouldn't really be thinking of problems. That just slows you down, that gets in the way. Besides, the overlords may not like you to call it that. Instead, let's call those challenges. Challenges are fun. We like to solve challenges, don't we? So what have been some of the challenges with Inkscape? <sighs> Number one, legacy code base. Inkscape started as a GTK1 pro program that was inherited by somebody else who somebody else and somebody else who had it. Well, actually, it's gone through three main incarnations already, forking from one to another to another. It had some really poor modularity. If you're a software architect, that's all I need to say. Otherwise, if you're just your average programmer or engineer, we got tons of globals. Globals, bad. Find a global in your program, bad. Try to ever multi-thread your program? Oh. Oh, gee, who wants a multi who, who has a multi-core system anyway? Oh, wait, I do. Ten years ago, not so many people. Now, you do. Legacy. Really ugly. And then just the, the overall architecture had been plugged in, not in a clean, modern, abstract, layered, tiered way, among other things. Defaults were set in the widgets being constructed. So you have some internal things, your flags, your values, all this stuff that's going to affect how you're going to perform, but they don't get set to their functional defaults until the toolbar gets instantiated and thrown up on screen. may not be too bad if you're only GUI, but what if you invoke it from the command line to try to change a graphic and suddenly you're dividing by zero left and right? Or worse, dividing by 3.11278. Not good. 
Another problem is Inkscape is extremely visual. Command line tools, you can pipe through, you can test easier. You can also, no, users don't expect as much. If you mess with how a GUI looks, then people get bothered. Whereas, one, probably it's helpful even to think of a command line as a user interface. That's important. My, me speaking to you is a user interface. You could have just sit at home, watch this on the um, streaming, or just download the slides and read them. But for you in this room, you prefer to be in here, seeing, hearing, catching all this. So, so it's an extremely visual program, and people will catch that. It also has very active development, which means there's a lot going on, which is good, but means you don't have downtime. You can't say, okay, for the next three months, nobody touch anything. I'm going to change it. You, you could branch. You can do your work on a little side branch, but the main branch is going to be also operating quickly, so you have to constantly sync back and forth, back and forth. Or you could just wait to the end and spend two months trying to merge back. You know, big problem. Not, not that easy. And it has a very diverse user base. Some tools are very focused. GIMP, for example, has come out and said, we are the professional photo or painting, digital painting tool or something like that. They're not for the casual person. If you're trying to fix red eye, they don't want you to use their tool. They're trying to clarify what they are and are not. Inkscape serves many different markets, and it can. And often a program is bad when it stretches too far, but Inkscape is capable of serving many different markets. Say, or groups of people, so that's handy too. So that's a problem. Well, a challenge, let's see. So aside from the challenges, what are some of the advantages we had? Well, first of all, it's a very refactor-friendly project, which means one of our tenants is code first, ask questions later. You don't have to go through committee. You don't have to have your patches accepted. If you have an idea, make it happen, which it sounds like a recipe for disaster, Except we have a, also a hard rule, don't break the trunk. You can do whatever you want, don't break the trunk. Also, don't break existing functionality. Add what you want, can be half done, okay, but don't change the existing functionality without collaborating with others. So there's a good environment for us to try some of these things in. It's another benefit now is it's extremely visual. What is also a problem is also, or a challenge is also one of the benefits, is you can see stuff going on. You can see when you make that difference, and end users can see what's going to happen. Very active development means you get a lot of feedback, and the diverse user base, among other things, lets you know, oh, yeah, I covered this person, but these people over here in Britain who are using Inkscape to run their cutters for their scrapbooks are hitting a problem. We're not serving them. Or this guy over here who's using it to run a laser cutter to punch out metal, you know, you don't know about these things until you hit them. So the user base, very handy. So how did we come to this point? This is, this is probably one of the better items here. Is that at the Libre Graphic meetings, which are trying to be a collaboration of all open source projects that involve graphics of any form, and their users and artists, and casual people who might be interested and just want to walk in off the street. Everyone comes together at the Libre Graphics meetings. Plug, there's one in May in Brussels coming up that if anyone can get there, is very good to attend. So the GIMP UI was getting redesigned, if anyone's been aware of that. Peter Sicking and others had done a really good job by this point of making things a lot more usable and not just, oh, we're the experts, we tell you how to do it. But they're actually come into the project, participate, become members of the team. Very helpful stuff. And they presented a lot of their information there. But more importantly, Michael Terry of the University of Waterloo up in Montreal came in and presented the results of his NGIMP project, which a couple years ago, they took the GIMP source code, did a baby fork, filled it up with spyware. Fully disclose, monitor what you're doing in a nice, clean, acceptable manner, informing you of what you did, so they could send it out in the wild and let everybody use it and watch what they did. And they presented their results. There were some very interesting things. The presentation is available online for streaming. I really suggest anyone who even uses software to look it over, because you'll get an idea of what to ask for. Even if you're not developing it or coding it, if you're using it, you need to know. Now, leading up to this, so that is the researchers showed up at this graphics meeting. 
than the coders internally. We've been working on cleaning up Inkscape's architecture and UI and development for a while. And I'd been working on something which, in the vague sense of where I, in my mind, I was just thinking profiles. But I've had target user profiles, target output profiles, color ICC profiles, target really old related term. I didn't have a term for it. I didn't know, but I knew it was something different. I knew I needed to go there. And then Michael Terry came in and said, presented adaptive UI. I was like, that's it. That's what we've been working towards. So then we have the pragmatic world and the academic world come together. Bingo, we've got it. Those two, I think, were probably the two best sources right now to look for usability information, refactoring, anything like this that might be associated because it's very open, very available, but there, is, there are more sources to see. Working on this, being aware that you need to look is probably the, the strongest thing you can do. So what is it we actually were doing? As I mentioned, this refactoring. Well, the first thing I've taken from web design or web architecture that states this very well is we need to separate presentation from information. So what does that mean? Well, for a, the programmers out there, you need to get split your data model from your UI widgets, first of all. Widgets respond to the user. They don't push into your database. They don't perform queries. You, you, you want to layer that, get your business logic out of your GUI logic. I like to think of it when I'm developing software is, okay, I might do this as GTK but I might have to do in curses, or I might have to do a command line, just pure command line, or I might have to give a socket interface for a web service. If my program can keep functioning in all those situations, then I have a clean separation. Even if I, I never implement it like that usually, but keeping that in mind lets me get that separation down. You also want to make sure everything's initialized correctly as you're starting up. You don't want to leave random values because, oh, when you run as the GUI, it will set them, because when you don't, you miss it. Or if you refactor and change when and where you initialize, it goes bad. And in similar to that, you want to avoid feedback loops. If you have one class, it calls another class to initialize, which calls this class, which calls the original one again and again. I've had to chase down some ugly ones where you set a value, it takes a string version, sets the string version, parses the string into the value, set the value over and over, over 20, 30 times to just change one color on a widget. Then we want to also go to using an event-driven or asynchronous approach. This is probably good advice for anything that talks to users, that has other programs or app works with, that operates on the network. Big thing. Big Iron IMAP server, mail services, are asynchronous. IMAP or peer-to-peer -peer or SMTP or all those need to be asynchronous because you never know when someone's going to, if you're a mail server, you never know when someone's going to open up and send you a piece of mail. If your architecture is dependent on a precise order of things, people will break it. So don't assume, say, set it up. Make sure you have it. Like you don't have toggle, toggle bold if you're doing a text editor because are you trying to turn bold on or turn bold off? Well, it depends. Do you even know if it's on or off? So don't assume to say, don't, also don't break encapsulation. So in exposing state, don't just say, oh, here are all my internals of my complex structure. Use it. Because when you go to uh, update it later, you can't because someone's using it so you can't change your structure. So you want to balance those two. And then the, those are, the details of those are generally available and easy to find. But this last one is a subtle thing. I used to think wasn't, wasn't too bad, but then an engineer explained to me that the on foo naming is harmful. You get this a lot in Visual Basic and other approaches like that. The, the first problem there is that you're naming a function for why somebody called you, not what you're going to do. So you say, on button click. Oh, someone, this is the function that reacts to a button click. Where? Which button? When? Why? What's it going to do? And then you say it, it punches a SQL query off to the server. That, you, know, you want to actually have the function named query current state or something like that, or fetch results. Maybe if you have to have the on, on button click handler, you just put a call directly into that other one. Among other things, what happens is, well, gee, not everybody uses the mouse. Somebody likes to hit enter. So you add the on enter function, and you copy the body of the on foo function, paste it into on enter. Then somebody realizes, oh, yeah, but with this will toolkit, you hit spacebar. You also get it. So someone copies it 
and puts on space bar. And suddenly you've got all this rogue child getting out of control, out of sync stuff, which is just horrible. So that subtle thing right there in event-driven systems, if you either don't use that naming convention or proxy off to the real functions that say why you're calling it, really help. And this, then, is an example of what we had gotten to a while back, where our internal layout is no longer hard-coded. It's not compiled in. Well, at least as far as normal GUI widgets and everything are. You see, this is XML. In fact, this is GTK old-style UI builder kind of XML. Um, it's, so it's XML-based. It's evaluated as runtime, but it's a hard-coded string inside the program. Why is it hard-coded in the program but not? Well, in this case, it's because this type of XML I consider extremely ugly. It's exactly what we don't, well, not exactly, but it still has too much of what we don't want. They've tied presentation to the information. So in this case, you can see if you look very closely and you have good eyes, but otherwise I'll read it for you. It says like tool item action equals Y action. Tool item action equal with action. So we have these actions we're going to perform in response to the UI events. If you go to the menu and trigger this action or click on a button, trigger the same action, it's the same, except if you want it in a toolbar, you have to call it a tool item. If you want it in the menu bar, you have to call it a menu item. Why not just call it action? You know, so we didn't want to expose that to the users because that makes it harder to maintain going forward. So we need something else. We need a new format. That's a very minor step that's probably going to come up pretty soon. If anyone else cares and wants to participate in defining something a little cleaner, we're definitely interested. So then what did we hook in? Now that we had that, it had been dynamic, we've learned about adaptive UI, how do we start to actually connect it together? Simple way to test is a simple, just manual add a button, add button in the toolbar or a menu item to switch the UI. Simple way to reset it. If you make your UI dynamic, People will mess it up. People will get lost. People will get confused. Make it easy to go back. Um, the one thing I haven't implemented yet is a separate big red button right at the top of our UI so that no matter what you do, no matter how you scramble things, drag things around, you can always get back to someplace sane. That escape is very important. And then technically, another thing that's interesting is tagging. Who's familiar with uh, just ad hoc resource tagging? Like you might use on Flickr or websites or anything like that. Yeah, that's what we're talking. User gets to arbitrarily just put whatever words describing this on. You don't decide. He does. Why? Because you don't know every single user in the world. But that individual user probably knows himself a lot better than you do. We have project defines ones where you know some things we're going to put out as stock initially, and we want to combine those with user define. And we have li a library started, implemented that you can pull. It's tri right now in the Inkscape code. It's tri licensed, so you can. Get GPL, LGPL, and MPL. So that one subsection that implements this. And we're trying to create the standard and implement it at the same time at the Create Project, which is all these open source um, creative software collaborating together place. And then, oh, hardware adapting. We have to adapt to the hardware. Netbooks I mentioned, but gee, look at all these. <laughs> There's a lot of hardware. How many people don't use any of those? Yeah. How many people use more than one of these? Yeah, over half at least. And yeah, so you have multi-monitor setups, handhelds, consumer devices, television, picture frames, very fancy nowadays, even toasters. And I verified, the, I think it's Evil Mad Science Laboratories or something like that. They have a very nice CNC toaster you can use as an output device. Get your, you sit down at breakfast, you get your toast, and it tells you your weather report all right there. So moving on a little more, we also wanted to do an incremental improvement cycle. Since we're refactoring friendly, since we have the dynamic quick do whatever you want, we have unit tests, we have users testing, just don't break it, we could do that. And then the users get to see what we've done. Because we have a very inclusive community, we have a lot of users looking at it day to day. If I check something in, there's a good chance within an hour somebody out there somewhere in the world is using it. Incorporate the feedback, repeat, over and over. Watch for emergent behaviors. So you don't want to do complex Bayesian engines and all this other stuff right off the bat. Try to go as simple as you can. 
just the act of adding resource tags so that end users can tag something allows for so much apparent complexity out of nothing. That is important. Keep it simple. So we want to just predict the user. Is it a beginner user, intermediate, advanced? Are they, you know, a little bit on that way? Um, visual, auditory, spatial. Some people like a list of items. Some people like a map. You know, keep that in mind. Not everybody has that same mind. But user experience, how we want to realm on it, a beginner, newbie, and then preference for proprietary information. In this case, that means I don't want to use this. It doesn't look like Photoshop. It's better. No, but it doesn't look like it. Yeah, okay, okay. And then have as few aspects as needed. A couple of Booleans your engine class will have, or perhaps just a level floating point zero to one. It's very handy. But just focus on getting the task and getting it done. Now, real quick, I think we're almost on track for this. want to see if we can... Where did you come from? I'm going to see if I can switch over to a live copy. Oh. There we go. So, hey, it actually came up. I compiled it yesterday. I, I knew not to compile it this morning. But th if someone's familiar, this is only slightly tweaked from the current Inkscape you knew a week or two ago. But now I've added this one tiny little item task. So putting it in just manually first, and say I don't want the default task, I want the custom task. Boom. There you go. Things have been turned on and off. Oh, the tools are up here instead of down there, and now these are over here, and yeah, that's still at the same place. Handy. Yeah. Let's try putting it back. But I mentioned you netbook users out there, so that's one of the first things I put in. Oh, let me look in here. Oh, where'd the task go? It's not there anymore. Oh, yeah, it was back up here. There it is. So with dynamic UI, you have to remember that. You're moving things around. People are used to it a certain way. Don't go too wild. But for the hardware, in this case, we have a little widescreen layout. So now the toolbars are all on the side, only one on the top because that one's not quite done yet. And so now this system, when we launch up, will query the, the screen. Oh, you want it as a netbook, your widescreen, tiny aspect. We'll switch into this mode automatically for you so you can just use it. But if you want to manually switch, you can. And then, of course, some of the things aren't quite done yet. That's always fun to see stuff break in a demo, isn't it? Anyone, anyone want to see something break? Yeah, yeah, okay. At least one mask is Inkscape. Coming over. Let me show you what I'm doing. Oh, incomplete sections. Isn't that nice little terminology? Okay. So here's our nice little friendly Inkscape-y thing. Oh, yeah. Doodle oh, wait a minute. Let me pick, pick a good tool. Uh, calligraphy. That's good. Doodle -doo. Different colors. Oh, I got it someplace else. Never mind. I'll hit that. Oh, it's transparent. No wonder you can't say it. It's a color, but transparent. Okay. But we don't care about what's in there. What we care is that, look, You've got these stacked on top of each other. You can't use them. So let me switch to that widescreen task. I want that to go that way when I'm working in one manner. Boom. Isn't that helpful? <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that one toolbar needs a little love. It's actually a dozen packed into one container that we switch. It needs a little. So be aware of that kind of thing. You may not hit it. Try to be the first one to hit it before the users do the next day and you're out to dinner. So, oh, wait a minute. Before I get lost again, task default. First item, reset. Probably put the reset it here button right about here or as the first menu item in one of these two is most likely. And then let me, I've got one or two. I have the various screenshots for the demo in here in case it didn't go live, but it did. So we'll skip all those. Ah, here we go. Now remember when I had that little Borgy version of our program that takes over with the cybernetic overlord? This is when you want to keep it in mind. Given that you can do anything, don't. Minimize surprise for the users. Keep it suggestive and assistive, 
but don't take over. Don't be like Clippy. If nothing else, just remember that. Don't do like Clippy. You'll do fine. Uh, collect next steps, especially collect usage information. In GIMP was great. We're going to probably try to coordinate the same thing, either formally or informally. Instrument the code, put it in the wild, make sure you fully disclose everything. University of Waterloo has a department that helped them with that. Um, and you can watch people using it, but don't talk. Just look. That's the hardest thing. If you're going to observe someone using your software, you, you, they're, oh, no, no, don't click there, don't, don't. Very difficult, but you must do that. Just stand back with the tab and write, write down every single thing they're doing wrong. Just go, oh, no, and they did this, and they, oh, they broke, oh, no, yeah. Don't say anything. Don't tell them to be, because even doing this, uh, <laughs> ah, ah, oh, as someone's using it, that will change how they use it. You can't do that. Um, I think Mark Shuttleworth even presented this at one of his recent keynotes. He called it STFU. Developers can watch the users in testing, but they must STFU. And avoid overboard on the intelligence. I know engineers, I know you can do some amazing things. Don't. Just say no. And there you go. So do we have any questions out there? Stretching or asking? Or just, I don't care about interfaces, I just want to type at the command line. Anyone? So uh, how is the, the tasks that you just implemented in Inkscape different from perspectives in Eclipse? Well, the first difference I've seen is that the perspectives are ugly. They, it's too joined. It's too easy to break. Uh, the Crystal Reports perspective is one that I think is horribly bad because it breaks all my key bindings, literally. But import, more importantly, it just switches to a completely different program. That's what it looks like. And also, it's for the overall. Like, I'm coding Java. I'm debugging. Two separate roles, pretty much. Whereas we want to go, yes, I'm trying to find this function. I'm trying to step through this variable. So to me, separating coding and debugging, for me personally, was too much. But there's some stuff that I want to be the same across both, smaller. So I, I'd say perspectives are usually in the role category. Um, I was going to say, uh, does this, this looks like it kind of requires that the user still kind of knows what they want to do or knows what it is called because they still have to go and choose it. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask was how you think this would apply to web-based stuff, if there's anything different or if it's going to be easier or harder. Ah, well, I would say for, for the user right now, the first step, we made it explicitly, you have to choose. And I just hard-coded one or two things to put the technology in to make sure I could make toolbars appear and disappear, dialogues embed or features turn on and off like the grid. That's just for the initial testing. The next step is to allow the users to define their task or task sets, I think is what Michael Terry called it for Ingen, was you just say, this is, these are the sets of tasks I want to perform. And when I'm in this task set, put this menu here, hide this one, show this dialog, get rid of all these, but we're gonna allow the users to do that dynamically. One of them is to drag and drop the toolbars to different sizes, different sides, sizes, alignments, add tool items, remove tool items. We have to get the right balance to enough configurability but not overkill. And then they just say, remember this task or task set. They give it a name, they give it a couple tags. And then the other thing was that when you go then, the expected, which is once we collect a little bit of information and we have tag data, which we have the tag implementation, we just don't have a tag cloud picker widget yet. We add a little widget that when you're on this task, let's show all the other tasks with all the same tags, then all the other tasks with some of the same tags, so that you just click it and right there is what you want to do next. Then we might be able to get a little bit of automatic, like, well, the first thing is netbook. When you're on a netbook, we can definitely tell. We can definitely switch the UI, no questions, and we can be assured that 90% of the users are going to like that. So that can be automated. But otherwise, we want to just facilitate. So 
So, next. So the um, one of the attributes of the current user interface that we have is essentially based on the lowest common denominator. Um, keyboards and mice have been the same for the last 40 years. Um, the graphics have improved, but not by that much. So when you're proposing to actually adjust an application towards certain tasks, some of us are unlucky enough that they actually have to work in multiple applications at the same time. At which case, the task-based approach gets really interesting because you have to share the same task across some, but not all, of the applications because often enough you tend to do two or three tasks at the same time. At which point you need the support of at least the window manager and preferably the desktop environment as well. At which point it gets really, really hairy. Do you have any outlook on where to go on that in that regard? Yes, I do, because first thing I think of is a feature that I miss so much from Enlightenment that others haven't picked up, but window groups, window sets, where when I'm programming, I have my Emacs window, a browser window with my code referencing, and a console window I'm running in. I want those together, not the apps, but just these three windows, each from a different app, I want to move together, work together, be, because I'm using them in that task. A little later, I want a different set. Um, the window manager in Lightman did that, but there are other ways if we have collaborating apps, we can share that information and share it without having to involve the window manager. We could if needed, but there was an interesting project just started to collaborate between some of these um, graphics apps, Scribus, Inkscape, or two of the first ones, and then interoperate with GIMP and two that we're thinking of a workflow manager that will help you set the same color management settings in all apps, get your same custom gradients into all apps, and when you edit it in one, they show up in others, and coordinating, so an external program that coordinates these other programs, and that's the Viaduct product at Viaduct project at create.freedesktop.org, and that's definitely appropriate there. We could play with the window manager if they have some APIs for us to leverage, and if not, we could do it independently, and that is exactly the type of thing we're looking at going on in maybe the summer even. Yeah. Any more? How are we set on time? One, two other questions, real quick. No, two people. People too hungry. Ready? Need to need to eat. Must feed brain. So, last question. Going once, twice. All right. Well, Thanks, John. Thank you very much for having me. And so thanks to LinuxConf and the Open Clip Art Library where I got all this beautiful little art to throw on. Oh, oh wait a minute. I have a question for you now. First person to answer. What changed in the corner of the slide at the beginning? Kiwi fruit. What else? Did anyone else notice? The penguin, did anyone notice? It adapted, yes. Adapted to this environment. He's the bluey. There you go. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Yeah.